So when do you last remember a preacher preaching on Amos two weeks in a row? It's probably been quite a while. Last Sunday, if you were not here, um, I preached from Amos chapter 7, where God gave Amos a vision of a plumb line. And if you missed that message, it is on our website. You can catch up with it and listen to it or download it and listen to it at your convenience. Uh, but we're going to continue this week with the minor prophet named Amos from Amos chapter 8, starting at the ver first verse. This minor prophet who was a farmer who God called to preach this message. This is the word of the Lord starting in verse 1. This is what the Lord God showed to me. Behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, The end has come upon my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The songs of the temple shall become wailings in that day, declares the Lord. So many dead bodies. They are thrown everywhere. Silence. Does any of that sound like now? Hear this, you who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make the ephah small and the shekel great and deal deceitfully with false balances, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the shaft of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account, and everyone mourn who dwells in it? And all of it rise like the Nile, and be tossed about, and sink again like the Nile of Egypt? And on that day declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for an only sun and the end of it like a bitter day. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. Will you pray with me? Lord, bring us into your presence and help us to hear with joy what it is that you say to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. God shows Amos a vision of a basket of summer fruit. I don't know about you, but I love this time of year living in Southern Maryland for this reason. The screenshot that is up right now is uh, from a stand owned and operated by one of Trinity's members, Sue Cox and her family. That's from Spider Hall Farm. Um, are there any of your favorites in that basket? I don't know about you, but it's about sweet corn time for me. I love that, uh, being able to stop at more than one Roadside stand on the way home and have a nice dinner, isn't it? Fresh sweet corn. Um, tomatoes have been on for a while. Peaches are there. Um, Sue told me this morning that they have just been picking blackberries. And so if you'd like to get some of those, my grandmother made the most awesome blackberry cobblers. Any of you remember those? Oh man, they were good. Just a cup or two of sugar to help add to the flavor. 
not much, about three quarters of a bag, something like that. But it's a good time of the year, isn't it, to enjoy these things. Now, the other thing I had forgotten about living in Southern Maryland, though, in addition to the awesome produce that we can get just by stopping along any one of a number of road stands, is that here in Southern Maryland, um, along with the produce, uh, I might want to add uh, this to my produce. As I'm coming through, um, I had forgotten that here in the land of pleasant living, uh, you have places, and I can think of more than one of these, where you can stop and get your produce, and they have hard crabs there. Just get those too while you're on the way. That's not bad eating right there, boys and girls. Uh, bring the crabs home with the sweet corn. Uh, God gives Amos a vision, and his fruit basket may have been a little bit different because Amos was living in a different place, wasn't he? But you still get the idea. Uh, Amos is given the vision of a summer fruit basket. Summer fruit is ripe right now, and when it's ripe right now, how long will it last? Not a long time, will it? You better get on that soon and very soon. Because if you wait when it's ripe, what happens shortly thereafter? It becomes deteriorated, it rots, and in effect can be destroyed. The point of Amos's vision from God was that the Lord's patience had been going on a long time with His people. But the end was nearing soon. I want to show you again verses 1 and 2. He said, This is what the Lord God showed me, Amos wrote. Behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, the Lord said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. And then the Lord said to me, The end has come upon my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. Now, for those of you who were here last week, you may remember that last phrase was in last week's reading too, wasn't it? God said, I will never again pass by them. And that phrase does not translate real well into English. Its meaning is not apparently clear. One of the meanings probably is, God has said, I have watched you doing what you're doing for a long time and I'm not going to let it go on forever. He says, I will never again pass by them. In other words, I will not let pass forever what you've been doing. Does that make a little bit of sense? God says, I will never again pass by them. I'm not going to allow what you've been seeing to go on forever. And if you look at verse 11 at the end of the text, he says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, and from north to east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord. See that in yellow? And that's on your bulletin cover. What's interesting to me is the service that does the bulletin cover left off the last Part that is in white after the yellow print. But they shall not find it. They will seek it. They'll run to and fro from sea to sea, from north to east. They will seek it desperately, but they will not find it. God says through Amos, you will see a plentiful harvest now. Things will dramatically change soon. How many of you have ever heard the phrase dead right? You know what that means? That means eat it now or forever hold your peace, right? It means that decay and destruction are coming. And God sends this message to his people through Amos. He says there is going to be dramatic change soon. How many of us in the last two weeks just in the events of the news, have wondered if destruction is not upon us. 
This morning what I want to do with this message is to uh, preach for a little while about this theme, hungry and thirsty. God says that they will soon be hungry, but not for physical food. God says soon you will be hungry for spiritual food. And through Amos, God notes that there are some things happening among them with which he is not happy. The first thing God notes is they're trampling the poor. They are not treating the poor well or righteously. The second thing he says through Amos is there is some dishonesty in business. If you look at verse 5, the end of verse 5, well first of all, he says, when will the noon be, moon be over so that we can sell grain? In other words, uh, when's Christmas over? We need to open because we need to make some money. When's Sunday over? We got to open up so we can make some money. Well, we went past that, didn't we? We have now godly people open seven days a week. And uh, here's something else just to, to uh, rattle your brain for a minute. Talking about dishonesty in business. How many of you have noticed that the stuff you're getting in the grocery store is getting smaller? Uh, we bought some paper towels not long ago. And man, when I used to get paper towels, there was a big old wad of those things. And I picked that thing up and I thought, this is about half a roll. They've decreased the number of paper towels while leaving the price the same so that you won't realize that the price is different. It is different, isn't it? Because you're getting less. And I'm not here to gossip, Lord knows. And you didn't hear it from me. But those people at Edie's Ice Cream... Lord knows I don't have any business up in that, but I'm just here to tell you that container's gotten smaller and smaller. Can I get an amen from anybody in the congregation this morning? I'll tell you what, I don't know who's packaging that premium ice cream, and I'm not talking about that nasty IGA stuff that some of you want to bring home for 99 cents. That's worth exactly what you paid for it, 99 cents. I'm talking about the good stuff, right? They, they noted what have happened to the packages? Smaller and smaller. Because you are certainly too dumb to notice. And we're all too stupid to pick up on that. Um, Through God, Amos quotes him as having a problem with some dishonesty in business. And then the third thing he mentions is a loss of spiritual integrity. And that's a little harder to dig out. But here's what God said. He said, your festivals, your religious celebrations are soon going to turn into mourning like as if you lost your only son like he died. And many places in the minor prophets they are very hard on the religious professionals of the day. God has a lot of heartburn about what his preachers say and about what they do not say. This morning I want us to look at what it is God says. He says they will soon be hungry and thirsty. And in verses 11 and 12, he also talks about how they will one day be hungry and thirsty for God's word. But he goes on to say this, they'll be hungry for it and they will search for it everywhere and not be able to find it. And you may say as you're sitting there this morning, What do you mean not be able to find it? Well, there are churches everywhere, aren't there? There are churches all over the place. You ought to, it's not a problem hearing God's word. How many of you know just because something's in a church is not necessarily God's faithful and true word? You know that, don't you? Just because it's in a church does not mean it's faithful to God's word. And so God says through Amos, there's going to come a time when they will seek it not be able to find it. They'll look for it all over the place. They will thirst for it. They will hunger even for the wrong thing and not know it. Here's something else I'd like you to remember as we go through this. He is talking about folks who hunger and thirst for the wrong things and by the time they figure it out and they're looking for it, it's too late. You and I are living in a world right now where we are told 
that often we don't choose what we hunger for. That our genetics or other biology has predisposed us for our appetites and our hungers and our desires. And there is much of that that is true, but the best lie is 90% true. It's that 10% you've got to watch. Because then what happens is we are told, you don't have any responsibility, you don't have any role, you don't have any control over what you want and what you desire and what you hunger for and what you thirst for. That's preset for us. I'd like you to think about this. You've heard a lot of talk about homosexuality, haven't you? I'm not going to talk about that this morning because I'm not an expert on that. But I do want to talk to you for just a moment or two about heterosexuality and the sin in the church that has been rampant for a long, long time. For instance, at work, a married person works alongside someone of the opposite sex on a project or they work together closely for quite a while and they notice that there's an attraction. And they don't do anything about that because it's just an attraction. There may even be some flirting that happens. But if a person does not Notice that and take care of it early. What can happen is you eventually start to have other thoughts. For instance, man, they are so much better than my spouse. My spouse would never do what, what they do, would never think what they think. And, and that thought then and that desire is allowed to grow and to fester until eventually that thought process, those desires that are allowed to live so long eventually turn into attraction, don't they? Very few people start at a hotel room, get up in the morning and say, you know, I think I'll have an affair today. But many a Christian couple have found themselves at a bad place because for months or for years, a desire was allowed to grow in an ungodly and an unhealthy way. I cannot tell you how many, and I'm not, since I'm a man, I'm going to just talk about men for a little bit. Ladies, you all talk about yourselves in group, okay? I can't tell you how many husbands have sat in my office over the years and say, I'm leaving my wife, why? Well, because I'm attracted to this person I work with. She's so much prettier than my wife. She's so much different than my wife. She will do things my wife would never do. And as I listen to them and watch that family explode or that marriage die, and often I will say to them, if you put half of the energy into your marriage that you put into the affair, you'd be so happy at home you wouldn't know what to do. Notice how quiet it got in here. You can hear the pump on the air conditioner, a little fan turning. See, I've never, I haven't understood this for a long time. There's a whole lot of lightning and thunder and heat about homosexuality, and there are a lot of Christian marriages blowing up, homes exploding, folks not happy in their marriage. And God, if you are married, God sent me today to tell you this. God designed you and calls you and wants you to be happy with the person to whom you are married now. Stop and think about the awful plight Mrs. Swecker has had for 32 years. Stop. Some of you have joined the other congregation we had on our anniversary. You sent her sympathy cards. That's real nice. How long do you think after our wedding was it that she saw a more handsome man? About 30 minutes, probably. And I told her, too bad. So sad for you because the deal she has done till I stop sucking breath on this earth, you are done with me. You are done. I told her, don't even tell me about any offers you get. I don't want to hear about it because I would say, well, yeah, yeah, he looks better. He's got more money. He's more charming. 
Why, shoot, I don't even know why you stay with me. I can't understand it. Does anybody understand what I'm saying to you? We do not marry one another until something better comes along, do we? To have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, <laughs> for richer, for poorer, <laughs> in sickness, <laughs> and in health till that big dude stops taking breath. point of what I'm trying to tell you is we have a tremendous obligation, don't we, to cultivate what goes into our heart, what goes into our eyes, what comes in our ears. You have a choice to make, don't you? We're being told over and over again, well, all of those things are preset. Well, they may be, but that does not take away our obligation, does it? To work with whatever God gave us, to do the best we can. And when we make covenants with one another, they are not until something better comes along. They are, if they're godly covenants, they're usually lifelong covenants, aren't they? And there are some of us in this room who will tell you, you may go through some difficult times as a married couple, but if you will put the energy and the commitment into stuff at home, that other people do fooling around at the office or the pool or the bank or wherever they go. If you put that effort in the home, God will bless you in that. And God will make your home a wonderful place. Anybody hear what I'm saying this morning? You and I decide whether we will cultivate those things or not. Sin comes to us Desires come to us that are awful and God gives us the ability to decide to cultivate that. When that sin starts to take root, when it starts to be a thought, when it grows into being a desire, it is time to get your hoe out or your cultivator and go through that and get it out of your garden. Right? Throw it out on the side. What happens to weeds when you throw them to the side? They die like they're supposed to. God gives us the ability. Amos preached to a people who had allowed their own thoughts and pleasures and desires to overcome them and no longer cared about what God wanted in the slightest, in their treatment of the poor, in the way they did their business. How can you stand up and say praise the Lord and then go to work on Monday and mess somebody over? Cheat them, right? He says in here that we want the, the ephah uh, smaller and the shekel greater. The ephah was like a bushel basket that you measured stuff in. Make that smaller. Like I was talking about the roll of paper towels. Giving people less for what they paid for. You and I are living in a world today that focuses mostly on pleasure. Many of us, the reason we go to work, the reason we set our lives up the way we set them up, is pleasure. Did you know even in a depression or a recession, high-end businesses do well? Those who sell RVs, I talked to somebody who sells swimming pools, installs them in ground. I said a few years ago, remember when the uh, recession hit hard, 2007, 2008, 2009? I went to him and I said, you must be hurting, aren't you? How are you doing? He said, hurting? I cannot hire enough people to put in enough pools. My business is through the roof. Because we, more than anything else, want pleasure. And in fact, there's a resort, I want to say it's outside of Jamaica somewhere, that named themselves Hedonism 2. That's the name of the resort. In case you don't know what hedonism is, look it up, Google it after church. Hedonism means a philosophy whose sole purpose is the seeking of pleasure. Hedonism. Our people and our culture has become affixed to it. 
The world can blow up just as long as your air conditioning don't go out and your satellite television. Because people will get upset about that. They don't care whether the neighbor's starving next door or not, but by Jiminy, that heat pump better be cranking air conditioning when I go home today. You and I living in a culture focused on hedonism, on pleasure, on pleasing ourselves, when in reality we have been in the midst of a dead ripe culture, what happens to dead ripe fruit? In very short order, it rots, doesn't it? It's not good for very long. And in fact, my preference is I'd rather not eat it dead ripe. I'd like to have it about a day before that, maybe two. Any of you ever seen those black bananas? Nasty. I want to eat that bad boy while he's still yellow and maybe a hint of green. Not all green, because that'll make you sick. That'll go bleh. But you understand what I'm talking about, don't you? We are living in a culture, maybe, that's dead right. And we're looking at, we're seeing the process of a decay that's coming. You and I, though, have been called to a different life. We're called to a cross, aren't we? Jesus did not say, follow me and you'll have all your pleasures taken care of. What did he say? Follow me and pick up your cross and walk. And if you want to follow me, deny yourself. Anyone who follows me will lose their life, and he who loses his life will find it. People read that and go, what is he talking about? Because again, we're living in a hedonistic world. Come to Christ. Live for Him. Realize that the pleasures of this life are temporary. They are dead right. And they, in about a day or two, start to rot. There is a Native American folk tale told of a grandfather who's trying to help his grandson. The grandfather says to the young man, There are always two wolves growing inside of us. One that wants pleasure and the other that wants the things God wants. And the little boy said, which wolf wins? And the grandfather says, the one that you feed. Will you pray with me? Lord, there are at least two natures within us. A, a, a nature of sin and a nature, Lord, that you created to be like you, a, a nature of spirit. Lord, if there be anybody listening to these words who's not started a relationship with you, Lord, who hasn't begun to walk with you, who hasn't claimed you as their own, Lord, I pray that today would be the day that we would start to be hungry and thirsty for the Word of God, for the presence of God, for the things of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.